My name is uh, Lee Robertson, and I know you've already spent uh, a week or so uh, doing x-ray scattering, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, sources and techniques we use for doing neutron scattering. And I'm not going to go into Bragg's Law and all that, because I, I know you've already, already heard that. So uh, I work in the uh, source and instru instrumentation group uh, here at Oak Ridge. I, uh, I work both at the s and and at the HIFR on instruments. And uh, so let's get started. Let's see. I should also mention that, you know, two hours ago, I was canoeing across the lake with my Boy Scout troop. So uh, I have to try to sh mentally shift gears here. Uh, so if I start yelling at you in my Scoutmaster voice, just go with it, okay? <laughs> uh, so here we go. So what is a neutron scattering instrument? Uh, well, it's a way, uh, an instrument we use to uh, collect the data on your uh, sample, okay? And we measure the number of neutrons scattered by a sample as a function of the change in the wave vector, so you already talked about this in your x-ray work, and the change in the energy of the neutron. So we measure two things. And what do we need to accomplish this? We need a source of neutrons. We need a method for selecting the incoming wave vector. We need a very interesting sample, because we don't spend our time looking at boring samples. And we need a method for determining the outcome, the wave vector of the neutrons after they're scattered by the sample and we need a, a, a way to detect those neutrons. Okay, so here's a little cartoon. It shows the source, you have your incoming wave vector, you have your scattered wave vector, you have your detector, and uh, typically uh, when you actually do this kind of work, you're trying to measure uh, two parameters. You try to measure the change in the angle of the neutron when it interacts with the sample, and you want to change, uh, measure the change in the length of the wave vector as it, uh, or the change, change in its energy or its velocity, however you want to look at it when it interacts with the sample. Okay, so uh, why don't we just build uh, one kind of neutron scattering instrument that measures those two things, the change in the angle and the change in the length of the wave vector. You know, why don't we just have one kind of neutron scattering instrument? Well, there are a lot of reasons for that. We have a lot of different kinds of neutron scattering instruments. Uh, again, there's a little cartoon, but we have two types of sources, continuous and pulsed. I'll say about, a little bit about that on the next slide. Uh, we have two methods for determining the neutron wave vector. We have time of flight. Okay, you know, you can, uh, if you know how far the neutron has to travel, you know how long it takes it to get there, you, can, you know its velocity, right? And that's the length of the wave vector. Okay, and uh, diffraction. Uh, just like you did with x-rays. You can use that to determine a wave vector. You have two types of scattered neutrons, those that are scattered elastically and those that are scattered inelastically. Okay, some neutrons come in, scatter off the sample, and come out without changing their energy, and soon, some neutrons exchange energy with the sample. The ones that don't are called elastic neutrons. The ones that do exchange energy with the sample are called inelastic neutrons, or neutrons that are inelastically scattered. And there are two types of interactions between neutrons in the sample. There's the nuclear inter interaction and a magnetic interaction. Okay, basically this means that uh, the neutron can either scatter off the nucleus of the atom or the neutron can uh, scatter off the uh, magnetic state of the atom, okay, because the neutron has a magnetic moment. Okay, you probably didn't talk about this in a lot of detail uh, at the X-ray source. Uh, you know, this is something we exploit a lot with neutrons. Uh, because the fa of the fact that, uh, unlike a photon, uh, a neutron does have a magnetic moment. Okay, we, we study a wide length of uh, length scales, a wide range of length scales, dri and that's driven by the science you want to do. You know, sometimes you want to look at the interactions of one atom to uh, a neighboring atom, which is a very short length scale. Sometimes you want to look at how two large molecules interact with each other, which is a very large length scale. Uh, the energy of the neutron is coupled to its wavelength and velocity just by equations like this, which makes sense. Uh, you have the de Broglie wavelength, and uh, the velocity of the neutron is related to its energy, and which is, once again, related back to its wavelength. Okay, so typically, what you're trying to measure is S of Q and omega, or S of Q and E, 
uh, the scattering pattern of uh, the momentum transfer or the Q and also with the energy transfer. And these properties uh, depend only on Q and E and not the neutron's wavelength. That's an assumption that we make. And the message you want to get from this very long slide is that there are many types of neutron scattering estimates are needed because of the accessible Q and E ranges depend on the neutron energy and because the resolution and detector coverage have to be tailored to the science for such a signal limited technique. Okay, when I say signal limited, I mean the uh, number of neutrons that reach the detector here is far, far less than the number of photons that reach the detector in an X-ray experiment. So you have to really optimize everything and make as much use as you possibly can of every neutron that's coming from the source. Okay, moving on. We have the two types of sources that I uh, talked about a minute ago. There are the pulse sources and the continuous sources. Here at the S and S, where we are now, this is a pulse source. And uh, if you look at time versus the neutrons generated at a pulse source, you have a, a, a spike and then it decays off. So all of your neutrons are uh, generated at, uh, in a very short time period. So because of that, you can use a technique called time of flight. Okay, you just measure in time uh, how long it takes neutrons of different velocities to reach your sample and use that to distinguish their energies. So if you look at, at the neutrons in this pulse, uh, the peak neutron production is nearly is 10 times the neutron production you get at the reactor, which is a, a continuous source. Okay, so if you can make use of this time structure in your experiment, you gain a lot. You know, if you were to take, go down to the reactor and somehow have a, a method for, uh, you know, having a shutter that opens and, and closes quickly, right, so just let a pulse of neutrons out, your little pulse would be 10 times weaker than what you have here at the SNS. But on the other side, if you integrate under this blue line and, and uh, compare that to what you get when you integrate under the green line, you have uh, about 15 times the total number of neutrons. So if your experiment doesn't make use of the pulse structure, you're much better off uh, doing your experiment at the reactor. Does everybody understand the difference? You know, if you, if you can use the pulse structure, you want to do your experiment at the SNS. If you can't use the pulse structure, you want to do your experiment at the reactor. It's just the rule of thumb. So the next thing I'm going to talk about, uh, why is it shaking? Uh, oh, it's the, the uh, air conditioning. Um, for a continuous source uh, facility, uh, you have your source, you have neutrons of all different wavelengths coming off the source continuously at time, and typically we use a crystal and diffraction to select the incident wave vector. Okay, you just set your crystal up to diffract the uh, wavelength of neutrons you want to use in your experiment. You know, I show uh, here I'm representing wavelength with color, okay? And so we've selected red out of the spectrum, okay? So the, the monochromers selecting red, all the other neutron wavelengths pass on through. So the red neutrons come, they interact with the sample, okay? Some of those uh, pass on through the sample, but some of them are scattered, okay? So in the elastic case, we assume that the wavelength of the neutrons that are scattered into KF are the same wavelength as the neutrons that were in KI, the incident neutrons. Okay, when they interact with the sample, you measure this angle and you measure how many neutrons per second are arriving at your detector. Those are what you're gonna measure. Okay, so if you want to uh, use the same technique to do an inelastic measurement here, in the scatter beam, you can replace it with another crystal monochromator. We usually refer to this one as the analyzer crystal. And you can set it to, uh, to diffract the same energy as the a, as a monochromator crystal. And the, in that case, you would be measuring the same elastic scattering, the same wavelength K, for Ki and Kf. But uh, you can do that sometimes just to screen out the noise and improve your uh, signal. Or you can set the analyzer crystal to select a different wavelength than the monochromator crystal. 
Okay, so here in the picture, I've, I've uh, set this crystal to select the neutrons whose wavelength uh, correspond to blue. So what I would be measuring here is I come in, I scatter by some angle, I'm measuring how many neutrons change their direction by this angle, and how many neutrons change their wavelength when they interacted in this, with the sample from red to blue. Okay, and that corresponds to a change in energy. Remember the wavelength, the energy, and the velocity are all related to each other. Okay, so uh, you know I can rotate this crystal, I can measure at this scattering angle how many neutrons exchange X amount of energy with the sample. Okay, and that way I can measure the inelastic uh, scattering. Moving on, we go to the time of flight case. This is what you do at the uh, at the pulse source, at a spallation source. So you've got your source, some distance away, you have your sample, and beyond your sample, you have your neutron detectors. Okay, so uh, when the uh, pulse is generated at the source, you have in a very uh, narrow time slice, you have all the wavelengths. And as this pulse of neutrons travels down the instrument to the sample, in time, the faster neutrons get further and further ahead of the slower neutrons. The high velocity neutrons corresponds to short wavelengths uh, are separating in time. This goes on as you move down the instrument and you finally interact with the sample and then you get scattered into the detector array. So now I know how far it was from the source to the sample and from the sample to the detectors. So for the elastic case, I just take, I know this distance, I know this distance, I measure at what time the neutron arrives at the detector, and from that I can compute its velocity, I know how long it took it to get there, I know how far it went, so I know, what, I know it's uh, meters per second, the velocity. And from the velocity I can calculate its energy or its wavelength, right? They're all coupled together. So that's all I need to know, and just to give you an idea of what these numbers are, for uh, 1.8 angstrom neutrons, it's very common wavelength right in the middle of the uh, wavelength spectrum we typically use. That's about 2,200 meters per second that neutron will be traveling, gives you an idea. Uh, the time of flight, right, is just related to the uh, distance and the velocity. And there, uh, if you measure the distance in meters and the uh, wavelength in angstroms, you know, this is a conversion constant you'll see uh, quite frequently to move between the uh, parameters. You know, if the distance from here to the detectors was 20 meters, it'll take a one angstrom neutron about five uh, milliseconds to travel from the source to the detector. It'll take a two angstrom neutron 10 milliseconds, the difference of five milliseconds. So your time here that you're trying to measure is on the order of milliseconds. That's not that difficult to do with electronics. You know, and you probably want to push that into the uh, microseconds to get the uh, time resolution you really want. But those are the kinds of times you're dealing with. And this is just rearranging this equation to show how the, you can calculate the wavelength if you know the time it took, the time of flight, and the distance. That's how you would calculate that. So you can take this even further and do, you know, this, is, this is the uh, configuration you use for an elastic setup. Uh, you can do the same thing again. You know, my pulse is generated at the source. I'm traveling down the beam line, the fast neutrons are getting further ahead of the slow ones. And I can put in what's called a Fermi chopper. Okay, this is a, a, a spinning assembly and only neutrons with, with a particular velocity can pass through it. All the others will get absorbed. So now I've done essentially the same thing I was doing with the monochromator crystal in the uh, continuous source setup. I've selected an incident energy. Okay, the Fermi chopper rejects all the other uh, incident energies. So now I come on in, I've selected red, I interact with the sample, and now I measure the time of flight again. But this time I measure the time of flight only from the sample to the detector. Okay, so now the quote unquote, the red neutrons have arrived at the sample and some of them uh, exchange energy. So I get a new color spectrum coming out, a new distribution of neutron energies. And I use the time it takes to go from the sample to the detectors to determine how many neutrons of each energy are arriving. You know, I, knew, I know the incoming energy, 
So anything that's different from that incoming energy at the detector are neutrons that exchanged energy with the sample. And depending on what direction it is from the sample to uh, different places on the detector, that tells me the angle that they were scattered by. So those are the two things I need to know. That tells me my Ki, my Kf. So I can figure out everything to get S of Q and energy. Okay, moving on. Here we are. Neutron optics. So I've, I've been talking about how, how the two different sources uh, uh, are used, you know, to set up uh, the uh, just canonical, very general neutron scattering instruments. So I'm going to take a little talk a little bit about the uh, actual uh, devices that we use on the instrument to manipulate Ki and Kf, and also to transport the neutrons. So we use monochromators and analyzers, just like I showed you in the little cartoon about the uh, scattering instrument at the uh, continuous source. And you can monochromate or analyze the energy of a neutron beam using Bragg's law. It's very simple. I'm sure you all understand how that works. Uh, we use choppers, like the Fermi chopper I just told you about. They tend to be rotating disks and uh, like uh, uh, curved veins. Okay, so that as the neutrons pass through it, only neutrons with a particular velocity can pass. So you can use uh, choppers also, just a big disk that's spinning with some holes in it. So only neutrons arriving at the disk at a certain time can pass through. You know, if I go back, oh my goodness, to here, you know, I've got this pulse, but I've got this long tail coming off. So, you know, I need to know at what time the neutron started in order to measure its time of flight, right? So neutrons that are in this long tail are probably not neutrons that I want. So I can use a disk chopper to only let neutrons pass through that are arrive at this time. I can, I can cut out all that. So it gets rid of those neutrons that I don't want because I don't know when they started their trip. So if I don't know when they start, I don't know how long it took them to get to the uh, detector, right? So you don't, typically you don't want those. Here we go. Ah. So that's what choppers do, guides and mirrors. These are like, uh, I'm sure you, you talked about some uh, uh, transport fibers with, with the uh, x-ray work, but basically these are uh, devices that act like a fiber optic for neutrons. You know, if the neutron enters a, a tube that's coated with the, uh, these neutron mirror uh, materials, you have total external reflection. So if the neutron hits the wall of this uh, rectangular tube that's coated on the inside with the mirrors, at a small enough angle, it will bounce down the tube. You can put gradual bends in these tubes and it'll follow them around. So it lets you pipe the neutrons away from the source where the background is lower. And there's all sorts of uses. And also you can, you can use the same technique to make neutron mirrors to deflect the beam in a new direction, or you can curve the mirror to actually focus the neutron beam. We'll talk a little bit about, more about that later. You have polarizers and spin manipulators. Remember I talked about with neutrons, you can measure the nuclear scattering. You can also measure the magnetic scattering. Okay, so if you're, for example, in the easiest case, if you're doing a diffraction pattern, you can measure the way uh, the, um, in a crystal, for example, the uh, different nuclei are arranged. You know, where, what kind of atom is where on the unit cell. You can also measure a separate diffraction pattern telling you where the spins on the atoms, the magnetic spins are located, how they're arranged. So you can measure both of those things. And we use uh, various devices to uh, manipulate the neutron magnetic moments, or what I'll call the neutron spin, uh, to do, to measure that magnetic diffraction pattern. And we use collimators, that's just to limit the divergence of the beam, typically. You know you've got your beam, your neutron beam or your x-ray beam coming down your instrument, and uh, not all of the neutrons are traveling in a parallel trajectory. You know, you have some spread and angle. Okay, so when you try to measure the change in the angle when the neutron scatters from the sample, you can't know that change in angle any better than you knew, know the incoming direction of the neutrons, right? You know, if you don't know what direction the neutron came from, it doesn't matter how accurately you measure the direction it was going and what's coming out, that change in angle, you don't know it any better than you know the incoming direction. Right? So you can use these collimators to limit the angular spread of the incoming neutrons 
which makes your measurement of the outgoing angle more, what we would say, have higher resolution. So that's what those are used for. And then detectors, there are a few different types of detectors, but uh, they almost all depend on uh, uh, detecting the neutron via some secondary ionization effect. You know, the problem you have here is the neutron is neutral, it has no charge. It makes it very difficult to detect. So we, what we typically do is we use the fact when the neutron hits some particular kind of atom, it will cause an ionization process and we detect that ionization. Okay, I'll say a little bit more about that later. Um, okay, move on. So I'm talking about, you know, we were just talking about resolution. This is a, a, a figure I stole from Roger Penn because I was too lazy to draw my own. Uh, so the uncertainty in the neutron wavelength and direction limit the precision that Q and, a, Q and E can be determined. Okay, so in the diagram, I've got my incident wave vector Ki, I've got my final wave vector Kf, and this cube, this uh, parallelogram here represents the uncertainty in Ki, and this one represents the uncertainty in Kf. So just like we talked about, uh, these, the Kx and Ky part of this uh, are depicting the um, uncertainty in the incoming angle, you know, how well you know that. And then Kz, the length, is basically talking about how well I know the wavelength of the neutron, its energy, okay, which is the link, tells me about the length of uh, uh, Ki or, or Kf. Okay, so when I'm trying to measure Q, you know, I've got some point inside this cube and some point inside this cube, so I, I get Qs between those, but I get a, a, a range in Qs of length. So I could be up here, the way down here gives me a longer Q vector. I could be up here at the top, or down at the bottom of this one gives me a shorter Q vector. So there's some uncertainty in Q because of the uncertainty I have in Ki and Kf. Okay, that is what we mean by resolution when we're talking about this. So I can do things. I can put in collimators to restrict the angles and make uh, the x and y components of this smaller. I can, uh, you know, measure the time of flight. You know, I can uh, restrict the starting time more and more and know more accurately the total flight time. That can shorten the uh, length of this box in this direction. And I can make this smaller and smaller, but as I do that, fewer and fewer neutrons meet the criteria to be detected in my experiment. So basically, as I make these volumes smaller and no Q with higher and higher precision, okay, the number of neutrons I'm seeing in my detector is going to zero you know, as I shrink those volumes. So it's always a trade-off. You know, do I want, is it, you know, am, I, am I getting enough neutrons to get a statistically significant signal in my detector? If I'm not, I have to open this up and, and sacrifice how well I know Q just to get enough neutrons in the detector to get a decent measurement of the intensity under those conditions. So uh, for scattering, the uncertainty comes, yes? Yes. Uh, we're, we're, we're making the assumption that this volume is so small that there's, there's no variation uh, over that. Even if there is variation over it, you can't see it, right? Uh, but typically, uh, in the, the, these uh, uh, experiments, uh, the neutron phase density, or the neutrons per unit uh, volume in the, in the, in the space, uh, is not varying very rapidly over this length scale. Okay, so for scattering, the uncertainty comes from how well we know K and KF. We just said that. For time of, in the case of time of flight, uh, again, we need to know, uh, um, yeah, it's basically the start time of the neutron is the dominant uncertainty in that case. And uh, the total signal observed uh, in the scattering experiment is proportional to the phase space volume. Here we're talking about these, these volumes. And as you, like, like we said, as you shrink those to increase your resolution, the number of neutrons that you actually can use in your experiment falls off much faster than you'd want it to, trust me, it always does. So, uh, okay, moving on. Now I'm gonna talk about my favorite topic, which is Lilville's theorem. 
This comes from uh, just standard optics. It applies to light in the same way as it applies to x-rays and neutrons. And basically it says that in geometrical optics, the propagation of neutrons can be represented as trajectories in a six-dimensional phase space. Whew. And uh, where the components of Q are the generalized coordinates and the components of P are the conjugate momenta. You've got three P's and three Q's. So all I'm talking about is you have a bunch of neutrons at some time T0. We know the location, Q, of each neutron. We know the momentum, P, of each neutron. Given that information, I can tell you where the neutron will be at some later time, T1. Okay? And as this grouping of neutrons changes in time, as, it, as its configuration changes, as it moves down the instrument, uh, we call that the phase space volume for that group of neutrons. Okay? So, simply stated, Louisville's own says that this phase space volume is conserved. Okay? And that when you, this is very complicated, but what this really means is that it costs you flux to increase the resolution, and it costs you resolution to increase the flux. You know, we are always in our minds coming up with schemes to try to increase the resolution without giving up any flux. But Little Vero's theorem says you can't do that. Every time, no matter how hard you work, you, in the end, you're screwed. You can't win. Okay, so if you want to increase your flux on the sample, you're not getting enough neutrons in your detector, you need more neutrons, you have to relax your resolution. If, if your resolution is too poor, you know, you can't see, you can't resolve the feature in the scattering that you're looking for in your experiment, you've got to reduce the flux to improve the resolution. You have no choice. There's nothing else you can do. That just means your counting time in your experiment has to get more and more and more because you have fewer and fewer neutrons arriving as you increase the resolution. Okay, I can show you, you know, a simple example. You have a parallel beam, you have a converging beam. If you converge the beam, you can get a lot more neutrons to hit your sample. But like I talked about before, you're, uh, you're increasing the uncertainty of the incoming angle, just like we talked about. So now I've got more neutrons, but I don't know what angle the, neutrons, the neutron arrived at the sample at. So when I try to measure the angle it was scattered by, I don't know it as well as I would if the beam were parallel. So that's just a simple illustration about how I can increase the number of neutrons. What I'm giving up is knowledge about what direction they were going when they arrived at the sample. Okay, that's just a super simple example so you can visualize what I'm talking about. Okay, so this, if you're an instrument designer like me, this is a terrible, terrible thing. You know, you know, I'm trying to make the perfect instrument. We have great resolution, high flux. You can measure tiny samples, samples that scatter weakly. But every time Louisville's theorem comes by, comes by to uh, tell you that you can't do it, no matter how hard you try. So now I'm going to talk about, show you some specific examples of some of these uh, devices we use to manipulate the neutron beams. We'll talk about four. We'll talk, we'll talk about some choppers and the closely related devices called velocity selectors. Okay, remember I was talking about uh, the pulse generated at the pulse source. You know, it goes up and has this long tail. We have these things called chopper spectrometers. It's a big disc. The black part absorbs neutrons. You have these slots cut, and the thing is spinning, and it's phased with the, pulse, with the spallation source so that these slots open up and let the neutrons through at very specific times in the pulse that's generated. So you can trim off all those neutrons you don't want. Only the neutrons you want can pass through it. And usually it takes several of these at different distances down the beam line to really clean it up the way you want it. You know, we talked about the Fermi chopper. This is the one that, you know, you had the time of flight experiment, you did the elastic case, you threw in the Fermi chopper to select a particular incoming energy, and then you measure the time of flight just from the sample to the detectors to do inelastic scattering at a pulse source. Well, a Fermi chopper is basically a big wheel. It has these uh, slots, veins cut in it. So as this thing rotates around, you know, if this, these openings were here, this is the neutron path there. They go in, and because of the curvature of these blades, only neutrons with a particular velocity, depending on how fast this thing is spinning, can pass through without one of these walls and being absorbed. You know, it's, it's that simple how it works.
Uh, here's a velocity selector. It's a very similar idea. You got these curved blades. I hope you can see that that's curved. So this thing spins around. This, this is the axis that it spins on right here. It sits in this box. This is the window for the neutrons to go in. And only neutrons traveling at a one at, with, a, with a particular velocity uh, as it goes through here, you know, the opening that it's passing through moves with it uh, based on its speed. Any other speed, it'll hit hit one of the veins and be absorbed. Yes? What are typical speeds for neutrons moving at? Uh, around uh, 2,000 meters per second. Okay. So it's not a ridiculous speed. It's not like the speed of light or anything like that. So, you know, the, the, the fastest ones we would deal with, with something like this might be moving, you know, uh, 10,000 uh, meters per second would be the, the fastest uh, we would usually consider. And all the way down to, you know, hundred, a few hundred in the, for the uh, very long wavelength neutrons. Yes? Uh, if you can tell me about uh, what material do you use for the proper velocity factor of the water? There's several possibilities. If you look uh, at the periodic table, certain atoms have very high absorption cross sections for neutrons. For example, uh, uh, well, hydrogen has a very high scattering cross section. But that's why we. When you look at reactors, they always have water core for shielding. The reason for that is that hydrogen is a very, has a very strong interaction with neutrons because it's just a bare proton sitting out there. It has about the same mass as a neutron, so they have a very strong interaction. But there's boron and cadmium and gadolinium are just some examples of materials on the periodic table that have very high absor uh, neutron absorption cross-sections. Those are not terribly good materials to make these disks out of because they don't have a lot of uh, strength. So basically, this is some other material with one of those elements embedded in it. It's typically how it's done. And this is just a, a timing diagram to show you about another very important aspect of uh, basically that you run into its spallation sources. You know, I talked about as the neutrons travel down the instrument in their pulse, the faster neutrons get further and further ahead of the slow ones, okay? Well, if, if your instrument's very long, then the fast neutrons from pulse N plus one can actually catch up with the slowest neutrons from pulse N. We call that frame overlap. And when you reach your detector, you, there's no way you can know if this was a fast neutron from pulse N plus one or if this was a slow neutron from pulse N. You can't tell the difference. So that, that's a problem <laughs> that, uh, you know, generally you want to make your instruments very long so that you get a bigger spread in the uh, neutron velocities, bigger time difference between the fastest neutron that's going to get there and the slowest neutron that's going to get there because that lets you measure the time more accurately, okay? But you can only stretch that so far because then this happens. You know, this, th this is pulse one. This is the fast neutron, and this is time and frame. Okay, this is distance down the instrument. You know, the really fast ones zip to the other end immediately. But as you go down, the slower, the slower ones get further and further over this way. And this is the fast ones from pulse two zipping through the instrument. And this red part I've showed up here is where they overlap. You know, you know neutrons in that region. I don't know if they were in pulse one or if they're in pulse two. I have no way of telling. So this line here represents as far as I can go with the length of my instrument without uh, getting into pulse overlap. You know, I can put a chopper in there and I can make this, this, narrow, this uh, pulse narrower in time, okay? But again, I'm throwing away neutrons that I can use in my experiment when I do that. So you have to think really hard about how you wanna do it. You know, I gain resolution, time resolution, as I make the instrument longer and longer, but I start having to throw away neutrons to do that, okay? Which is, they're very precious. You don't want to do that unless you have to. Okay, you'll, let, you'll actually, I don't know what experiments they have planned for you during your time actually doing some uh, experiments on your, uh, as group, in groups, but sometimes the instruments will throw away every other pulse just so they can let the slow neutrons go a long way and get high resolution. But they, you've, you've lost half your neutron flux when you do that. Moving on, and we talked about neutron guides. This is where the, the uh, rectangular um, tube acts like a neutron fiber optic. Uh, 
a waveguide. Okay, uh, you know this is the essentially the uh, think about this as the incident angle of neutrons that come in and hit the walls of this tube with some angle. And if the angle is small enough, you get what we call the regime of total reflection. That's where you get total external reflection. It's just like with light. You know, it depends on the index of refraction of the material. You all remember that from physics class. I'm not going to go into it. But if the angle they hit is small enough, they'll bounce down the tube. Okay? And then you can curve the tube, like we talked about, to get the out of line of sight of the source, have a much lower background. But once you get beyond the, what we call the uh, uh, total reflection regime, we get what's called the super mirror regime. Okay, so we actually, on the surface of the uh, substrate, whatever your tube is made out of, we alternate layers of high and low neutron scattering length density materials, and we vary the thickness of the layers. You actually get an artificial periodicity, satisfies Bragg's law, and to within certain range, the neutrons will bounce down the tube by diffraction rather than reflection. Okay, and you can, that, that way you can extend the... Uh, angle, the incoming angles that can be transported by the neutron waveguide and get more neutrons to your experiment. So this is just a photograph. Uh, this is the, when you have these, uh, this one's divided up into several internal uh, uh, passageways. And you typically want to do that when you're curving the uh, guide around to get out of the line of sight of the source. And the reason for that is, you know, if you go, if this thing's curving, you go way down the length of the waveguide before you bounce again. You know, the guide is moved because of the curvature, so the angle gets bigger. So you may be on, be beyond the critical angle, beyond the uh, angle where this thing will reflect. I mean, neutrons that hit with angles beyond here just pass into the wall material. They don't bounce down the tube. So you to uh, be able to get a sharper bend, you can divide the. Uh, the uh, guide into these uh, sections, so it only goes a short distance before it bounces again. So the, because of the curvature, the angle hasn't changed that much. So you can get uh, shorter and shorter wavelength neutrons to bounce around the curve. This is just showing a long guide. This one's at J Park, which is a spallation source in Japan, and they're just transporting the neutrons very, very far away from the source to do their experiment. And this is another guide installation at ISIS, it's a, a spallation source in, uh, in England, in the UK. And you'll see there's several guides here together. They're fanning out from the source to the, to the instruments, just to give you an idea of what these things actually look like in practice. OK. Next, we have polarizers and spin, in, spin manipulators. OK, there are several things we use. We can use what we call uh, uh, polarizing monochromators. It's just like a regular monochromator, but because of the chemistry, you can have, uh, we talk about the neutron, you have the two spin states, we call it spin up or spin down, okay, which represents the magnetic moment on the neutron. And you can, there are certain crystal materials where the one of the two spin states, either spin up or spin down, cancels with the nuclear scattering. So the thing actually only diffracts one spin state but not the other. So you come in with a neutron beam that has spin up and spin down in it, but after the diffraction takes place, you either have just spin up or just spin down. And you can use that to polarize the beam. Another way to polarize the beam, we use helium-3 spin filters, uh, where we take a uh, glass cell, like here's an example picture, and you can see the size relative to this guy's hand. And uh, basically, we polarize the nuclei, the spin on the nuclei of helium-3, okay? And we, so we change its absorption cross-section. It becomes very high absorption cross-section for one of the neutron spins, say spin up, but a very, it's almost transparent to spin down. So it acts like a filter. It'll absorb spin up and transmit spin down, or you can figure, out, can configure it to transmit spin up and absorb spin down, whichever you want. Okay, and the neutron beam just passes through, so you have both spin states going in and only one spin state coming out. Okay, that's also a way to uh, polarize the beam, but notice what we've done. In both cases, in this case and in this case, we've thrown away half the neutrons. Because when the neutrons are generated, you have equal probability of a neutron being spin up or spin down. So when I filter out one of the spin states, I only have half the neutrons left. That's a problem too. <laughs> 
So, and then a third way to do it is you can, uh, uh, you know, we we're just talking about the super mirrors. This is the same idea for making the neutron guides, the neutron fiber optics, the wave guides. But you can uh, tailor the mirror material so that it will only reflect one of the two spin states. Okay, so you can bounce your neutrons off a mirror and use the neutrons that bounced off the mirror will say be spin up the new, and the mirror will transmit the spin down. So you actually split the beam into spin, spin up and spin down. But it's, it's usually because of uh, geometry reasons, it's hard to use both of those. So you either use a, a transmission mirror where you throw away the reflected beam and keep the one that passed through it, or you can use the, the reflected beam and throw away the transmitted beam for the other spin state. And you can, again, you can, re, uh, you can choose which spin state you want to be reflected or transmitted. Okay, and here is an instrument that's, that's using this. You know, your neutrons are coming from over here and it passes through a polarizer. I forget which kind they were using on this instrument. And you have your sample here in a very tightly controlled magnetic field. Then you have a, a, another spin filter over here. Okay, the reason this is important is you can uh, polarize the beam to be spin up coming into your sample you can put another spin filter after your sample and say, well, which neutrons came in, interacted with the sample, came in to spin up, and remain spin up coming out, okay? Then I can take my analyzer uh, spin filter and tell it, okay, now I want you to transmit spin down. So now I can measure how many neutrons come in to spin up and uh, come out and spin down, okay? The reason that's important is because if the neutron scatters from the nuclear scattering process, the spin, if it comes in spin up, it comes out, goes in spin up, it comes out spin up. If it scatters magnetically, it switches from spin up to spin down. Okay, so now I can distinguish magnetic scattering from nuclear scattering off your sample. It's very important, it's extremely useful kind of measurement to do. And this here is uh, what we call a flipper. Okay, it just, you use the fact that if the, because of the neutron's magnetic moment, if it's zipping through a magnetic field, the moment will persist, right? Everybody remembers that from physics class. So if I use this uh, magnetic field here in the flipper, I can take a spin neutron, spin up neutron, and change it into a spin new down neutron, okay? Sometimes that's easier than changing the, the filter, on, uh, the analyzer on the back end, which spin, spin, which spin state. So I have, say, a passing spin up on this side and spin up on this side. If I put a flipper in here after the sample, I can change spin up to spin down, right? So now I'm measuring uh, neutrons that flip their spin when they interact with the sample. Or I can change the uh, field to transmit to not flip, okay? Then I'm measuring the other combination. That's generally easier than flipping the uh, analyzer itself. Okay, focusing optics, like I talked about, you can use mirrors to focus. You can also curve your monochromator. Here, uh, we've made the monochromator of a, of a bunch of little pieces, so we can curve them, and this we can focus the neutron on the sample. You know, remember, I'm giving up knowledge. When I do this, I can increase the flux, but I'm giving up knowledge about what direction the neutrons arrived, were going when they arrived at the sample. So I'm degrading my resolution, but I can get more neutrons in my experiment. Okay, you can use this to use another detect, uh, uh, technique we call a, a virtual source, where you can have uh, your big source over here, you can focus the beam, you pass it through a tiny uh, aperture, you make this a big shielding wall here, a big honking shielding wall, so that you don't see all the uh, background radiation coming from the source, it can't pass through this little hole, then it's, the beam spreads out again. The other side, you use another focusing monochromator like this to focus back onto the sample. You can do that to, uh, to improve your signal to noise. Yes? Um, you don't know this, but uh, is the polarization tied to the spin direction at all? Because if so, can you use um, the sample uh, like magnetic field to help polarize it or not? Uh, yes and no. The problem is the moment on the neutron is too small. You know, even for, for very low energy neutrons, I mean, there, there, there are people who, who do this. You know, you have to use a 
sextipole magnet to do it. But if the neutron is going slow enough so it stays in the magnetic field for a long time, you can, you can uh, set up a, a magnetic field the neutrons passing through that will deflect the neutrons of one spin state out of the beam and let the other spin state pass through. But the neutrons have to be going very slow, I means they have extremely long wavelengths. And for most experiments, those wavelengths are too long to be useful. You know, if you're, if you're talking about magnets of, magnets of uh, field strengths that we can deal with, you know, in the, in the lab. Okay, so virtual source is just an example of how you use focusing. You can uh, focus down to a tiny aperture, then refocus on the sample. Okay, and the fact that you, you have a very high background level over here, but it can't pass through, or not much of it passes through the small aperture, so you get a very quiet uh, uh, area to do your experiment. You have less, fewer, fewer stray neutrons coming in your, in your detector giving you background. Another way to do it, you can use mirrors, you know, like uh, the same mirrors we use on the neutron guides. You can curve them and focus the beam. This is an example where they uh, took a beam and fo focused it down to a diameter of 90 microns. You know, this, wouldn't, this wouldn't impress anyone who does X-ray scattering, but for, for neutrons, this was quite an achievement. And this is using Kirkpatrick's bias mirror geometry. There are many mirror geometries you can use. I won't go into all, all that, but uh, if you identify applications where focusing uh, optics can replace neutron guides, you can offer better performance in, in terms of getting more neutrons on the sample. But once again, Louisville's, tell, Louis, Louisville's theorem tells us when we do that, we're sacrificing resolution. Uh, so just, uh, you know, we were talking about why don't we build uh, just one time of neutron scattering for elastic instruments, which basically uh, refer to powder diffraction, single crystal diffraction, small angle neutron scattering, or small angle x-ray scattering, doesn't matter. Or reflectometry, uh, those are all elastic type scattering instruments. And here we have the Q range, and here we have the Q resolution that you need to do that kind of, for various kinds of science. And uh, here, for the different kinds of instruments we, we build, we build uh, uh, diffractometers. And that sort of covers this, this range in, in, in Q versus Q resolution. Okay, this is for measuring crystal structures, other kinds of structures. We have reflectometers, um, and then we have small angle scattering instruments, you know, to look at membranes, magnetic films, micelles, uh, polymers, and uh, alloy complexes, and critical phenomena, and biological structures, and, uh, as well as small proteins. Okay, so depending on what kind of science you wanna do, you pick one of these kinds of instruments uh, to access the Q range and the Q resolution that you need to do the measurements for that, that kind of science. Okay, so now we move on to some examples. This is a powder diffractometer. It's a time of flight machine. Uh, you know, we talked about D, the distance that you go from the source to the detectors. In this case, 64 and a half meters. Uh, this uh, is just uh, Bragg's Law. It lets you relate Q to the D spacing. This is an example diffraction pattern in the time of flight. You know, they're using the time it took the neutron to travel to 60, uh, 64 and a half meters. This is the detector bank. You know, the neutrons come in from over here. The source is over here. You come in, you scatter from your sample. It's down in this pit. And you have all these banks of detectors stacked around it. Okay, and the, the detectors are actually pixelated. This is a, a view of the sample pit. And so depending on which pixel, on which detector the neutron arrives, that gives you the angle that was scattered by the uh, sample, okay? And then you measure the time it took the neutron to travel that distance, and that gives you its wavelength. So you put those two things together and you can construct the, the uh, diffraction pattern. It works very well. Power diffraction is extremely well suited to uh, running on spallation sources. Okay, here we go. SANS instrument, it's like a giant pinhole camera. You got these, these long tanks. You got a detector on a little railroad car. It can run back and forth inside the tank. Do that to focus the thing. 
you've got uh, your neutrons coming in, you've got a bunch of guide sections I can move in and out of the beam, so I can adjust the effective distance between uh, the source, uh, actually this, the uh, velocity selector and the entrance aperture in the sample, and I want the distance from the sample, sorry, from the aperture to the sample to be the same as the uh, distance from the sample to the detector. Okay, if I move the detector up to the front of the tank, uh, I'm looking at a, a, a wider angle across my detector. So uh, I have less resolution, but I can see a bigger key range. I can move the detector to the far end of the tank. Okay, I see less solid angle off the sample because you're further away, but I have higher resolution. I can see smaller values of Q. That's why it's called small angle scattering. This is a picture of a, of a magnetic vortex lattice that was taken on the sands. Uh, and the reason the, uh, the detector is on the car is so when I adjust this uh, distance between the entrance aperture and the sample, I can adjust the sample to detector di uh, distance to match it, and that gives you the optimum configuration for the instrument. Uh, magnetism reflectometer. Here we're using the same principle that the neutron guides we're working on. You know, if the neutron comes in at a very small angle, if it's below the critical angle for total external reflection, it gets uh, reflected, otherwise it's transmitted. And you can use that. Uh, you know, if you've, if you've got some structure here at the surface, you get fluctuations in the uh, uh, number of neutrons reflected near the critical angle. And that's represented here. They're looking at a magnetic material, actually, at different applied fields, uh, five millitesla, 50 millitesla, 200 millitesla, and they can actually see the uh, magnetic profile uh, normal to the surface as you uh, pass through it. And you can see how that magnetic profile between the substrate and the uh, and two films, iron and iron nitrogen film deposited on the surface, changes with applied field. That's a, a way that you use magnetic scattering. This is a good one, it's easy to visualize. This is neutron imaging. I don't know if you did any X-ray imaging uh, at the synchrotron. Basically, the neutrons just come in. You have a, a, a sample over here. You're looking at the absorption image, the shadow of the sample. Uh, the, the neutrons come in, they get passed through a scintillator, which converts the neutrons to photons, bounce off a mirror, just into a camera. Very simple setup. Uh, and you're just looking at the shadow of the absorbing material in the neutron beam. Uh, here's a, a piston in an image, images of a piston in motion. You can see it move up and down while the uh, engine is running. So you can uh, image exactly what's going on inside. This is just an image of a bullet, you know, an x-ray image and a neutron image. This just gives you a, an idea of how the uh, scattering uh, absorption profiles are different for photons and for neutrons. Here the, the lead slug is very dark. That means very few high absorption for x-rays. And where the powder is, uh, it's almost transparent because uh, it's mostly light elements, so you don't get a lot of contrast, absorption contrast for x-rays. The neutron, in, neutron image, it's the opposite. The lead is very transparent, okay, but the grains of the powder in the bullet, which have a lot of hydrogen in it, when I mean, we talked about why hydrogen has a very high interaction with neutrons, you can actually see the grains in the powder. This is an uh, image of a carbon foam. You know, it's rotating, that's, that's used in lithium batteries. Okay, and we're, we, we filled it with the material so we could see the voids in the foam where the lithium's gonna sit. And we rotated the uh, sample and took uh, neutron images and constructed, using tomography to construct this image. And you can actually see the network of voids where the lithi lithium material is gonna occupy. It's a similar uh, diagram we talked about before for uh, elastic in instruments. This is for inelastic instruments. Uh, you go from uh, slow to fast and from uh, large to small. Uh, longer length scales are uh, 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 small Q. Uh, shorter length scales are large Q. And the different kinds of instruments, you know, you have a high resolution time of flight spectrometer all the way down to the triple axis, map out different regions in the science space, you know, that you can measure. So depending on what kind of uh, science you want to do, this chart would help you figure out what kind of neutron ins scattering instrument you'd use to do those measurements. A couple of examples, this is direct, re direct geometry 
uh, comma flight spectrometer. Uh, this one's called uh, Sequoia. Okay, when I say direct geometry, it, it means it's just like I showed you in the diagram. The neutrons come in, use a Fermi chopper. You know the, uh, the velocity of the neutrons when they hit the sample. They interact with the sample. Then you do time of flight from the sample to the detectors, and you can map out the uh, excitation spectra uh, for that material. Uh, this is a triple axis. This is one that uses two, a monocreator and an analyzer crystal that like we talked about at the beginning of the talk to do inelastic scattering. And you can do similar maps that you were doing with the uh, uh, time of flight spectrometer. Uh, and we have a, a, what we call an in inverted or indirect uh, time of flight uh, spectrometer. This one does backscattering. And when I say indirect, rather than measuring time of flight, rather than monochromating the incoming neutrons and using time of flight from the sample to the detector, this lets the white beam come in and hit the sample. It has a big array of analyzer crystals, just like uh, it uses diffraction to analyze the energy scattered by the uh, sample. And with this technique, you can get very, very high energy resolution in the micro EV range, but uh, it can only cover, has limited uh, Q space coverage, depending on your, uh, your selection of uh, energy resolution. Okay, this is just the instruments at the HIFR. We have some triple axes, some powder instruments, uh, the SANS instruments we, we just looked at. This is a macro molecular uh, diffractometer. Over here is where we do the neutron imaging, and here is a cold neutron triple axis instrument. At the, uh, here at the SNS, at the spallation source, you can see some of these instruments, this is the backscattering instrument, have very long uh, flight paths. That's to get that time resolution we were talking about. But you have a whole array of instruments, which you'll see on the tour today. They have, again, they have powder uh, diffractometers. There is the Sequoia instrument, is over here. Uh, this is an instrument for looking at uh, uh, diffuse scattering. Um, we have an in engineering uh, materials instrument and a cold neutron spectrometer. You'll see all those on the tour. Uh, some advanced neutron optics. You can use focusing optics to uh, uh, focus the beam on very tiny biological samples where they can, you know, they have difficulty crystallizing some of these biological materials. So, you know, a 0.1 by 0.1 by 0.1 millimeter sample for them is large. Okay, that's not a large uh, sample for doing neutron diffraction. So here we, we sacrifice resolution, you know, like we talked about, but we can get a lot of neutrons on a very small uh, crystal. Another thing we can do, we can use Larmor precession. This is where, uh, is a magnetic technique. You come in, you have your neutrons from the source, you pass them through a, a magnetic field. You know, we talked about how the neutrons process because of their magnetic moment when they're passing through a field. So when you pass through this field, you process by some clocking, some amount, depending on how long the neutron was in the field, which depends on its velocity. You come, you scatter off the sample. So it, if the neutron is scattered, it'll have a different outgoing trajectory. So this field is set up to exactly match that field, but has the opposite polarity. So you rotate the neutron back around to where it started, so it comes back. So if you started straight up, you got persist in here, and here you uh, persist it back to the, to the initial spin state. But if the neutron is scattered, it'll spend a different amount of time in the second field, so it doesn't come back to the right place. Okay, so you can use that to uh, encode the momentum change in the neutron in its spin. Okay, the, the one reason, there are many reasons you might want to do that, but say the, the, the scattering angle is very, very small. It's so small that the neutron is not even scattered out of the beam. You, know, you can still measure the change in momentum of that neutron uh, using this technique because it's, even if it's still inside the main neutron beam, its um, spin direction will not match the other neutrons that weren't scattered. Okay? Yes, that's how Sesame, Sesame uses this technique. Yes, to generate these two fields. That's right. Yes, there, there. Well, there's still a lot of. Uh, uh, yes, they're still testing it. There are lots of things 
that we still have to work out for this. There, there are like four or five instruments in the world now that are using this technique. And there's certain types of measurements, we know enough about it already that you can use them to do science. But there's still a lot of work to do to get this all figured out. Um, this is my last slide. <laughs> Concluding remarks, okay. This one says, instrument design is driven by the needs of the scientific community. You know, we don't build the instruments just because we think they're cool. We build them to do specific kinds of science. And, uh, but it has to be coupled with reality. You know, you're still stuck with Louisville's theorem. You're still stuck with the fact that the source, the sources are, are uh, flux limited compared to X-ray sources. Uh, and you need to do the maximum optimization you can with the optics and the detector technology. And in the near term, the things we're working on are focusing optics, polarization, you know, manipulating the neutron spin, uh, building ever more, ever more efficient detectors, uh, using the instrument development uh, infrastructure, which are basically computer simulations of different instrument configurations so we can test different ideas without having, you don't actually have to build it a, a physical instrument to test it. And we're uh, looking at new techniques and applications of neutron scattering to do new kinds of science, which isn't uh, served by the neutron scattering facilities uh, currently. That's it. <laughs>